for the technical difficulties. We had a bit of a challenge getting started, but just wanted to um, make sure that you can hear me. If someone could just give a yes, I hear you in the chat box, that would be great. Your voice is going a little in and out, Barb. Okay, thanks, thanks, Dana. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so, is that any better? It was, and then it got a little far away again. Figures. Okay. Um, so I will. That sounds better. Just. That sounds good. Okay, I'm gonna. You're doing not gonna now. move. Yep, I'm just gonna stay right here. Not gonna move. So thank you everyone for joining us for our very first webinar as part of our Women of PWN Dismantling Racism. This is a new project for PWN. It was developed from the Speak Up Summit in Florida in September of 2016. And we are very excited to be bringing a webinar today and uh, to introduce the follow-up or follow-on um, both webinars as well as discussion groups that will help PWN uh, really wrestle with racism, dismantling racism, how we can have honest conversations about racism both within our communities and amongst ourselves. So thank you for joining us today. The webinar objectives are simple. They are to gain an understanding of what work Women of PWN Dismantling Racism is committed to doing, uh, to understand why this work is so important and how we got here, and how you can get involved in the next steps. So while the objectives might be quite simple and summed up in those three points, they indicate quite a bit of work that we um, are fortunate to have a number of incredible presenters who are going to, to help us start these conversations. We have Laurel Sprague, Nana Kana, Carrie Hartel, Kat Griffith, Jenny Smith Camillo, Vanita Ray, Wanda Brendel Moss, and myself. And so thank you for joining us today. And with that, I will turn it over to Kat. Hi everyone, this is Kat Griffith. I just really wanted to open this up um, with us starting from a common place. Um, when we met at the summit, we created our mission of this group. And so that is to create a space for open dialogue, to address racism among ourselves and our communities in a spirit of cultural humility. I think Kat is passing off to Wanda, but Wanda, I don't hear you. Are you there? Yeah, I had to okay. get off mute. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is Wanda Brundle Moss, and I would like to welcome everyone that's online uh, for this topic of dismantling racism. Um, I want to reiterate that we know this is a tough subject, but we're all here to learn. This is our commitment that came out, out of what was born at the Speak Up Summit out of the affinity session. So let me read this to you. We acknowledge a long history of systemic racism, institutional privilege, as well as past and recent brutality. We are here with humility to stand in solidarity and hold safe space for our sisters and ourselves. We commit as white women to be an uncomfortable, in order to learn and grow as we challenge racism within ourselves and within our communities. We stand in sisterhood, solidarity, and most importantly, in action. Thank you, Wanda, and thank you, Kat. So we will go ahead and introduce the first of our presenters. Um, since we framed the conversation, we now would like to talk about what has uh, historically been PWN's engagement with race and how that has shaped our movement. And so Nana Kana, the Executive Director of PWN, will go ahead and uh, start for us. Nana, are you there? Yes, thank you so much, Barb. Hi, everybody. 
um, a big thank you to the women of PWN Dismantling Racism Working Group that has launched and put together this webinar. I really want to just shout out your leadership on this topic. It is so critical. Um, so I come to you as Executive Director of Positive Women's Network USA. As folks on this webinar probably know, we are a national membership body of women living with HIV, inclusive of women of trans experience. And we've been around since 2008. Um, we were founded by 28 women living with HIV. Today we have a membership of about 3,000 um, folks around the country. We have a lot of allies involved as well as women living with HIV and we have 11 chapters throughout the US. Um, and we, what we do is primarily build leadership among the constituencies most impacted by the epidemic and work to ensure that policies in the U.S. are responsive to the needs of communities most impacted by HIV in the U.S. today. And so, um, so we see dismantling racism as central to our work. It's not um, a tangent. It's not sort of a sideline or ancillary. It is actually the work we need to do. Um, and we sort of, you know, come to that from a just looking around at what is going on. And so I'll just talk a little bit about, you know, sort of how, how we see a little bit of the HIV landscape. Um, so why is it important to address race? Um, well, you know, just to be explicit about it, white supremacy does and always has um, structured power access, um, access to decision-making, access to resources, um, has always structured leadership, has always structured the HIV response um, because white supremacy is, you know, sort of as we'll dive into on future webinars um, as more of a concept, um, is central is a central ideology to how the United States was actually founded and created, and um, what made possible displacing Native people from their land, what made possible um, transporting. Um, transporting people to come here as slaves and basically built an entire economy on exploited labor. And so this entire country is very much founded on white supremacy and it's important that we recognize and acknowledge that. Um, we also think it's important to, um, you know, to sort of be aware that there are lots of race neutral narratives and this um, idea that it's better to not see color or that we can have responses that work for everybody or that um, or that we can even say things like, oh, you know, race doesn't matter. That's just not true. It's never been true. Um, race is a social, political, historical construct. It has served different um, purposes at different times. Race has been constructed differently at different times. Um, and so we we think it's really important to be explicit about pushing back that um, that race race needs to be addressed openly, um, and we need to have conversations that really center, center um, folks who um, suffer from anti-blackness and from white supremacy. If we look at um, leadership within the movement, if we look at representation within the, you know, quote, HIV movement, it often does not reflect those who are most impacted by the epidemic today. And so as an organization committed to building leaders, um, it is critical for us that we proactively shift that dynamic. Um, and then we know that anti-blackness is a separate construct from white supremacy, but an also pervasive construct shapes, um, shapes a lot of people's thinking. It shapes um, language, it shapes uh, policies and politics. Um, and one of the things I wanna say is that, you know, race is not just about black and white. Communities of color are also impacted by white supremacy. Um, brown people are impacted by white supremacy and by anti-blackness. And um, in some situations, for me as a South Asian woman living with HIV, there are ways in which I have benefited and my community has benefited from anti-blackness. And it's important that we are transparent about and acknowledge that um, and work to proactively change it. And so, um, and I don't think it's any surprise to say that 
the very conditions that predispose people to acquiring HIV in the first place or that lead to worse health outcomes once folks are living with HIV are also structured by race. Um, so when we look at healthcare access, poverty, the quote war on drugs, um, HIV criminalization, mass incarceration, all of these issues which really intersect with, um, with policies and practices that have long term been grounded in racial constructs from housing, um, housing segregation to you know, zoning where people can live, what kind of services they can access, um, who gets policed and targeted by police, who's surveilled in what ways, et cetera. So, all of these factors in our society are very much intersecting with, um, with HIV, and um, we bring that lens. So how does race structure the HIV response? Well, this is just a little snapshot for you of some of the folks who are leading the HIV response, and this is by no means all of them, but this is a handful of um, people who are you know, kind of leading the way at some of the federal agencies responding to HIV. Um, so here you see um, Dr. Laura Cheever from HRSA, Dr. Eugene McRae from um, CDC, Division of HIV AIDS Prevention, Dr. Jonathan Merman, also from CDC. These are some of the folks who are responsible for sort of defining the care and prevention response to HIV in this country. Um, I didn't unfortunately have time to, you know, put together sort of like a whole comprehensive list and also, you know, to be frank with the um, upcoming administrative transition, there are lots of changes happening right now. But, um, but if you look sort of historically at federal leadership, agency leadership, policy leadership, even who most of the Office of National AIDS Policy of directors have been um, historically, I think you will not be surprised um, to note that those, the communities most impacted by the epidemic are not represented in that leadership. Um, this other photo you see here is of the PACHA, the President's Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS that was sworn in when I was sworn in, um, in 2010 under Obama, um, this is the first PACHA that was convened post Obama's election. And so um, in 2008, and so it may be a little hard to see, but, um, but you can probably tell there's not a whole lot of color going on in this picture. And um, they're definitely, so these are, you know, sort of the quote community um, folks who are supposed to be kind of an expert panel advising policymakers on what our response to the epidemic should look like. And there are lots of great people in this photo. Um, by no means do I want to, um, you know, sort of dampen their, um, their expertise and minimize their, um, their leadership in the epidemic. It, it truly, they have all contributed a lot. But there is something, um, there is something, there is a clear problem when you see that on this first Pacha, for example, the only women living with HIV sworn in um, were uh, myself, a South Asian woman living with HIV, and there was a Caucasian woman living with HIV. There were no black women living with HIV, for example, on this first Pacha. And that's something that we had to kind of actively um, fight and um, work to get a black woman living with HIV appointed to Pacha, and that took some time. We were able to achieve it, um, but it's a battle that, you know, given the demographics of the epidemic, really shouldn't have had to be fought in that kind of way. Um, so um, there are also lots of ways in which I'm sure folks can probably relate to race and gender and lots of other things kind of structuring how participation in those kind of spaces works. And many people might be involved on like planning councils or a board of directors or some kind of advisory group where um, you have the experience of, you know, you can say something, um, you can say something and then somebody else who has like more credentials or is whiter or is, um, or is you know, presents as a cis male or something like that says the exact same thing and suddenly everybody in the room is like that's a great idea and you're like didn't i just say that so um you know so those, those are also ways in which race sort of structures our um, hiv response and decision making and certainly experience i had a lot of on on pacha um so then sort of taking a little bit of a wider lens i think we're all really clear that um that hiv is impacted by a lot more than just who's making decisions around hiv so 
just taking a you know quick peek at who um, the incoming administration is um, is has been appointing to the cabinet. I think you can see there's not a whole lot of um, diversity here, and this is a marked shift from President Obama's cabinet, which was um, very diverse, um, much more kind of grounded in a diversity of not just um, not just racial diversity, but also diversity of perspectives, you know, um, around corporate interests and things like that. So um, clearly, you know, there are a lot of these departments like the HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Department, HHS, um, education, et cetera, that very much intersect with HIV. And then if you take a more, you know, kind of like a smaller lens, looking at um, who's leading some of the biggest HIV organizations in the country, well, here are some of those folks. Um, this is not a comprehensive list or comprehensive, you know, pictograph, but these are um, these are the people who are leading CEOs or executive directors of GMHC, Housing Works, NMAC, AIDS Foundation of Chicago, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, NASDAD, the Black AIDS Institute, AMFAR, Whitman Walker Clinic, AIDS United. You can see. Um, that many of the folks leading these institutions are not that reflective of what the epidemic looks like today. And there are lots of reasons for that. And that doesn't have, again, you know, any bearing on these individuals' qualifications to be leading. This is about a system that structures people out of opportunities. And that's really what we're trying to talk about here. Um, and so um, I, you, it's, you probably also noticed that um, there is a gender problem on this slide as well. We're not going to talk about that as much today, but certainly it'll be addressed, um, you know, kind of in future webinars as we talk more about intersectionality as a component of looking at race. Um, so race is really pervasive as a structuring concept. It shows up in lots of different ways, primarily as, um, as power that is institutional. Um, it shows up in sort of everyday conversations that might seem not that obvious, like when you go to your planning council meeting and they're talking about priority populations and there's sort of just, um, you know, people just kind of accept that there are a certain set of populations that can be prioritized in particular ways and there's not really a lot of contestation necessarily around where those um, categories begin and end and what they actually mean. Um, Diversity training um, are also, you know, can also be problematic uh, in various ways, but they, they're very present in our organizations. Um, race always also comes up in the context of cultural competency. So um, this, you know, sort of buzzword, let's have our intervention, our public health intervention, uh, be culturally competent. Culturally competent is basically code for let's make sure that it works in a particular community of color. We don't really talk about things being culturally competent for white people, right? I've, I haven't really heard that ever applied. Um, so um, race also comes up as, you know, organizations where you see a lot of frontline staff who look like or share life experience or have like a peer relationship with clients, but then you look one level up at management or um, higher up at management, and uh, you know the the food chain gets sort of progressively whiter. Race also comes up in code, and I'll talk about that later. In words like community, um, and in a lack of consideration about how decisions or proposed policies might impact different communities of color differently, um, you know, sort of like a, not a one size fits all approach. And race as a structuring concept also comes up in our lack of comfortability in talking openly about race. Um, if you work in an environment that has, you know, people who are um, people of different races, people who are like, if it's a multiracial organization and there's not open dialogue or discourse about race, um, you can still be pretty sure that folks are talking about race, they're just not talking about it openly. Race is still there, it's always there. Um, and it's so pervasive, I think, as Wanda just said in the chat box, it's so it's so pervasive, but it may not be openly discussed. And we can really benefit by being more open about it. Um, so race is also very present in 
a number of sort of code words that are used um, and different types of what are called microaggressions that can come up. Here are just a few examples. Um, the word urban being code for, um, usually for people of color. So we have Ben Carson appointed to, um, you know, nominated to serve as the housing, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, although he actually has no experience in housing. He just happens to be the only nominee who is black. Um, but we see, but you see that kind of language in, um, in funding proposals, you see it in, you know, all kinds of things that are supposedly targeting particular communities where the word urban is really a code. Um, the same with inner city. Target populations, again, you know, sort of as a code. Um, and a, a code which can also be violent, right? Like it means something for populations to be targeted means that somebody else is targeting them. So if you really think about what that kind of language means, it's almost like there's some kind of uh, a bullseye on, on a community. Um, the use of the word illegal to describe people who are undocumented, that's a word that has been dropped by the Associated Press and other folks when this current political environment, we're definitely seeing sort of an increase, not in the use of that word by some news media sources necessarily, but by people. And there are some uh, news media sources who have never really committed to that reframe. Um, sometimes racial microaggressions can also show up as, um, as compliments. So, you know, saying, oh, that person is so well-spoken as if, um, you know, there's something implicit there. There's like some sort of assumption that, that they wouldn't have been in the first place. Um, taking up space in meetings or conversations without sort of awareness of racial privilege and how that dynamic might be playing out um, is another form of microaggression. Um, having research and presentations that talk about communities but that are not led in any meaningful way by people of or from those communities, right? So how many times have you seen some kind of presentation where um, a, maybe a researcher is presenting on work they've done for a community on behalf of a particular community? And maybe, they, maybe there's nobody from that community even speaking. Or if they are, maybe they get to come in at the end and share their personal story. Sharing a personal story in that kind of, um, in that kind of context, like sharing stories is, is powerful and transformative, but it can also be very tokenizing. And so, um, so frequently communities of color are used in very tokenistic ways. Um, also at conferences, practices like having a community panel and all the people of color just happen to be on that panel. And by the way, all the scientists walk out during the community panel and never hear from the community. Um, and then also um, narratives around personal responsibility, around um, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, um, around this idea that individual merit is the way that, um, that we succeed in this country. That is, a, um, that is a, a capitalist white supremacist narrative that downplays the way, that downplays the ways in which inequality is structured and um, that people have to overcome it um, and that we don't we don't need um, we don't need to be putting all this responsibility on individuals we should really be transforming the system that um, disenfranchised people in the first place so here are just a few kind of examples of how white supremacy culture might show up in organizational practice um, and probably you know all of us have done these at some times or another I know that I certainly have so um, using things like Robert's Rules of Order. I mean, when do we really need Robert's Rules of Order? So you can think of lots of ways in which um, people need to be very socialized in a particular way and need to understand a whole system of participation in order to even participate in the first place. Um, hiring practices that exclude communities that are most impacted, um, having a sense of urgency that doesn't allow for thoughtful input, meaningful input, from the community, thoughtful decision-making practices. Um, moving quickly in general can be, um, you know, a lot of things often feel urgent, but urgency can compromise 
thoughtful process and um, can result in political compromises that sacrifice those who weren't able to make it to the last minute meeting or who tend to be less represented in decision making processes. Or maybe the meeting happened at one o'clock and the people you're talking about are all working at that time and they're not paid to do this work and so they couldn't show up. Um, so you know, kind of like standing up and saying no to those sort of practices is part of ways we can undo white supremacy culture in our organizations. Um, another common practice is looking at entities that are white led and saying, oh, these entities need to be diversified. We're going to hire people who are people of color instead of prioritizing supporting people of color led entities and institutions or organizations that are clearly accountable on issues around race. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't kind of go through all of these, but I want to um, just point you to this resource at the bottom of this page, which does have um, a lot more information about examples of white supremacy culture and practice that folks might find useful. So to talk a little bit about what PWN has been doing, this is a um, an issue that we have been, you know, tackling for a few years. Um, we've We've sort of, we've tried to address race since we started out doing our work in, um, in 2008, since we started organizing, but we've been trying to take a more explicit stance on race um, over the last few years and really realizing that we need to address it more proactively even within our own organization institution. So in 2014, we had a, um, at our Speak Up Summit, a national leadership summit for about 200 women living with HIV, we had an evening session um, to look at, you know, what does it look like to build an effective and accountable multiracial movement? And you can see some of the folks who were in basically a fishbowl discussion on that. Um, we had a board retreat in 2015 where we brought in outside facilitators to work with us around um, race. And then in 2016 at our Speak Up Summit, which had about 250 women living with HIV, we, had, were, um, we were blessed to have a couple of times where an affinity group of white women committed to dismantling racism started to meet. And the, um, what they're going to be telling you about later on this webinar is their, the work that they're going to be doing moving forward. And we are so, um, so happy to be supporting this work to happen and um, to be, you know, really moving forward in terms of having these real conversations. The statement that Kat shared with you earlier is a statement that the women who participated in that affinity group got up and read at the um, at the end of the summit. It was an incredibly powerful moment in terms of white women living with HIV making a commitment to their sisters of color. And so um, I just want to talk. I just want to you know quickly end by saying there is a lot we can do to address this, and um, we are completely committed to that process. Um, over the next year, we're going to be launching a whole anti-racist curriculum project that um, I know Laurel and I think Barb are going to talk to you a little bit about later and ways you can plug into that. Um, it will involve reading groups, discussions, um, political education. We have to do political education. We need to deconstruct race. We need to understand it. Um, we need to understand how it gets used. Um, we, we need to understand our own privileges and our own experiences of oppression and how those play out on different scales, we have to be willing to engage in courageous conversations and center the communities that are most impacted by decisions, whoever they are. Um, and more than anything, we have to be committed to dismantling all of these systems and institutions, racism, patriarchy, white supremacy, within our own organizations, within our own institutions, within our communications, and even within our um, meeting practices, you know, the way that uh, the way that we facilitate meetings, the way that people get to participate in the meeting, the way that people get to um, share input or feedback. And um, this is a journey. It's an ongoing process. It's a lot of work to do. And we are, um, we are looking forward to doing it with all of you. I think the last thing I want to say um, before I pass this off to our next presenter is that this is, again, you know, this is not a side project of the work to address HIV in this country, this is actually the work. This is the most important work. Um, and we want to encourage 
all of you to think about it in that way as well. This is the most important conversation for us to be having. It is not a distraction. Um, if we can truly, if we can truly move forward in terms of dismantling racism, dismantling white supremacy within our own spaces, we can have we can move towards more transformative change in our systems, institutions, policies, and practices. And so, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass off to Vanita Ray. So while Vanita is getting settled, I'll just introduce her. Um, Vanita Ray is a board member of Positive Women's Network USA, also works at Legacy Community Health, and um, is involved in lots of different spaces. You might see her, um, including in a lot of intersectional movement spaces, like Black Lives Matter in the Houston area and other locations. Vanita, are you on? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. All right. So sorry about that, you guys. And um, thank y'all. This is really, really pretty uh, game-changing work here. So I'm, I'm just excited to be here and participate in something like this and, and support the work of others in dismantling racism, too. So I'm just going to kind of give a little bit of historical context from my perspective or uh, of one black woman's perspective about um, the kinds of issues in, in the context for where we as black women, I feel, are here in the HIV movement and elsewhere, and the way uh, we are viewed by American society that sets up, I think, why you see a disproportionate impact of uh, HIV on black women. So the, what I'm gonna just talk a little bit about is uh, black women in the epidemic, and, and like what I just said, the historical context, I think that it, it goes back to, to for African Americans when we were first brought here and the role and the treatment of black women. And then talk a little bit about some of the impacts I think we did with living at that intersection of race, gender, and HIV and of other multiple oppressions or uh, intersections. And then just some final thoughts that I had about moving forward in the HIV movement. And I think it's really appropriate. Nana, that was really awesome. I could have jumped in so many times when you were talking like, yeah. Um, so again, th this is the result. I, you know, if some of you have heard my, this presentation, I did it once before a couple months ago from a criminalization perspective, and the, the epidemic stuff was towards the end. And this time I choose to put it in the front because uh, this is this is the result. This is the problem. This is the effect, the impact of some of the stuff we're going to talk about. Um, where you know why black women are disproportionately impacted by HIV. Um, the CDC and others will talk to you about how our numbers are going down, the incidence of, of HIV. But until it looks less than 60% of the women living with HIV, it ain't gone nowhere for me. I, I mean, there's a reason, and I don't, I don't want, want to lose that by uh, saying that maybe we're recording less. Maybe the actual incident has gone down. They ain't gone down enough to, to, um, to uh, change the game about why black women are so disproportionately impacted. Uh, white women, 17% of the folks living with HIV, other women are white. 17% Hispanic, and uh, last year during the summer, I got a chance to go to South Africa, and I really, you know, hadn't thought about, I knew globally we were the most impacted, but going there really set it up for just, I just came back angry to know that globally, most of the people with HIV looks like me, and here we are 35 years later, and, and I, I just don't feel the sense of urgency why that is not okay. 
and, and so I asked this rhetorical question, but I love Samantha. Why black why are black women disproportionately impacted? And why does it why isn't that an issue? Aren't in American society, don't we protect our women? Don't we put them on pedestals? Don't we make sure that you know that they're taken care of? Why doesn't anyone seem to care? I this is where I feel they don't. Or we talk about this and really elevate this to the issue that it should be. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm a woman living with HIV, and I'm a grandmother, a mother, and it you know I come at it from a lot of different perspectives. Of what I have to confront and talk about in, in living with HIV. Oh, excuse me. So, I, uh, again, I think it starts here. I think, you know, and when I, when I say black women, there are black women who are not African Americans, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But for African Americans and for those of us who are part of this diaspora, um, you know, we've been, I think, from day one having to uh, live up to what Sojourner Chu talked about in our woman, you know, between from servitude, between either you work like a man in the field or you work like a, a, a man in the house or you're not owning your own bodies, you know, seen as, um, you know, used for our sex, you know, sexual ability or reproductive ability to produce property for others, you know, historically being viewed as a as men, and, and which is what Sojourner Truth wanted to get at. We can bear a child, but I got to be in the field with the guy next to me. You know, our value was definitely related to our sex and ability to reproduce. Um, I think as it evolved and we were seen as these strong black women, that was a way in, in which, you know, it was a it was a response to the conditions, clearly, uh, you know, and our men being taken away and things like that. But it was also a way that some of us and myself included have come to deny some of our needs or issues because if I'm strong, I'm taking care of everybody else, there's no one taking care of me. Uh, again, you know, we're taking care of others from, from the time on this continent till today. Um, our hair and bodies not seen as white women or other women, you know, uh, and, and I grew up and a lot of women in this country grew up with not feeling okay with our hair, wanting to look different. You know, I can always point to Serena Williams, one of the leading athletes in the country, and she's so, there's so many references to her comparing her to a male. I just, you know, but it's because she does not fit this other image of womanhood. So we bring all of this to the table when we're dealing with HIV, when we're trying to fight against racism. We're still coming from, we're having to uh, push against the tide from this kind of beginning as well. Uh, again, I, I, I just don't think we society or has ever felt a need to protect us. Uh, and then today, you know, whatever we've had to do to overcome, raise our children, try to bring them home at night, you know, we're stereotyped that this angry, demanding, aggressive, mannish women versus women who've had to survive. Um, initially, this, the women's suffrage movement didn't include black women. Black women have always, you know, there's been a, a little bit of a conflict within the feminist movement for black feminists. You know, having to choose between my black, can I bring my my issues of being a woman, but they are being a black woman to this table, and it was not always welcome. So I think it's, historically there's been a um, we we've been set up for I think what we're seeing today, the results of all of these uh, centuries of, of this perspective. And, and you know, and I, I'll say this, you know, we've come a long way, yeah, but you know these. These images might be kind of strong, but they are really the way I feel that, you know, we have, we have been the nurses. We have had to do some of these things. And still today, have we got there yet? You know, Sandra Bland, we, you know, uh, even a lot of times, even when we're marching in, in support of our men, we don't talk enough to me sometimes about the women that we've lost or the women that have sacrificed or the women that have had to do what they've had to do. So I, I believe we've come a long way with it. Women and definitely black women living with HIV in this country, we still got a long way to go. You know, and, and you know, and as a kid growing up, I used to be really angry because in school nobody taught me about people that look like me. And but these were some of the images that were around me, and I think they're still prevalent today. Either we're the Jezebel and hypersexualized, you know, and seen for our, you know, our our bodies are okay when we're being sexualized, but not okay when they're we're 
being talked or compared. I remember one of the greatest ice skaters, uh, Saria Bonalea, I maybe said her name wrong. She was beautiful from France, a black woman, but she never got credit because her body didn't wasn't as graceful and looked the way that other the other ice skaters look. You know, we dealt with being a mammy, you know, the we, we saw sitcoms and, and like the mother image of black woman, the, the mother image that's denying her the way she looks or something seems to be acceptable in some instances. I still can't buy the syrup, you know, with the image just because we are more than that. Um, and I'm not knocking mothers, grandmothers, and Mama Dia who had to raise my mother taking care of other people's house. The welfare mama, you know, this welfare queen idea when uh, the, the idea of welfare and this pension fund for wills was originally designed for white women, it didn't become a problem. I don't believe it until black women had to uh, utilize it. Um, and it became then the whole image of lazy woman just reproducing children so that she can be taken care of. Uh, and then the strong matriarch, you know, these very extreme images and stereotypes of black women we the strong, sexual, lazy, or on the mother. And, and I think these images follow us even today. You know, and so for black women living with HIV, we live at that intersection. We, I think we experience a lot of different forms of oppression, even within the women's movement, even amongst other women. Uh, and that's why I applaud uh, uh, PWN and the women here for taking this on and really looking at as an organization, how do we recognize the differences, acknowledge them, and put them all in our bag so, so that we make sure we don't leave you behind. Um, we, we experience racism, sexism, sometimes in the movement, you know, being forced to choose between being a black or a woman, that duality of existence that we sometimes have to, it's a tightrope sometimes to, to walk. I, I think in the black community, uh, we deal with you know, issues around the church, the, the faith-based institutions, and as well as the way our society or our community sees us, um, and, and being uh, sometimes du double stigmatized in our communities as women living with HIV. There are instances where we have overcome that, so don't get me wrong, but I, but I just, especially living in the South, know that uh, the church is still enough to crack and the women are, are still kind of uh, suppressed there in terms of their sexuality. Um, I, we, I still know that in the black community, patriarchy is still an issue. You know, we still, some things are okay for our men, but not for our women. We still live in that society that we have to constantly put forth who we are and our reason for being in. We don't have to be here angry. Uh, we're not trying to be a man. We're, we're women having to do what we have to do. And, and so that forces me, our experiences, to have, how, speaking up without bringing down my black men. I'm always concerned about that, but where is that line where I get to speak up for black women and I don't want to have to oppress black men? But how do we support liberation if it comes at the expense of black men or other women? And so sometimes that's a conflict for me. I've had to experience, um, you know, the recent uh, birth of a nation, you know, do I support the black director, writer, even if I think the message is wrong and, and, and being criticized for one choice or the other. Some of the impacts you guys are, I'm sure, probably all aware of issues around racism, sexism, some of the impacts of HIV and gender and, and race of, you know, women, you know, poverty, and employment, housing, all of these things uh, that could be threatened or that are usually that may be a challenge or we may have to work a little harder for a single parent to deal with language, culture, or othering, you know, being we're the other one, we're not the main one, you know, being in other spaces that always aren't inclusive to us. Violence, stigma, I've talked a little bit about access to care, the trauma of whatever violence, uh, an HIV uh, diagnosis. Dealing with incarceration for me in the community, whether it's myself or from the time that I can recall having to visit and deal with someone being incarcerated and being a mother, sister, aunt, the calls, just, it's hard to grow up without a, without a, a contact with a criminal justice system at some point and the impact that that has on us. 
And again, I talked a little bit about I feel like, you know, being stigmatized uh, in the community and in the church and, and still having to find a way to overcome all this. So, you know, I think that the historical context to me sets up for what I see or what I experience going on today. And I just wanted to say a couple words about moving forward in the HIV movement, which I'm so glad that we're having these conversations, that issues like this around race and racism, we know they fuel the epidemic, to, but to me, they're not discussed to the degree that they should, you know, other than talking about statistics or something. We just had an HIV is not a crime uh, a training academy, and the issue of race was almost like the elephant in the room. We had to call it, and it made so many people uncomfortable, and these are great advocates, but we're why are we talking about race? So, so to, to, if we have to explain it within our own movement, I know we've got to, at least at that setting, I know that it needs to be talked about more in our broader movement other than just the criminalization side. Um, we need to confront those realities of blackness and womanhood and, 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 and the racism and how that impacts our communities, our kids. I don't know. You know, I have a grandson, six to three, and with all going on, I, I'm concerned that I have to tell him how not to dress, how not to talk, how to look down to, so that I can bring him home at night. I, I don't know how you explain that level of fear to someone else. I think our movement needs to include the unique experience and expressions of all black women. And, and I spoke in the beginning of African-American women, but we have women of trans experience. We have African women, Latino women, black women range the gap. You know, there's a, we are a wide range of women and we bring our unique needs and experiences to this movement that will benefit us all. Um, you know, I was recently we've been talking about uh, involved in some conversations about our strategy for dealing in the new administration, and it was so interesting the discussion that went around the room. No one would call this, but we in the, at the end of the day when I had to call it, we, it sounded like we needed to change the face of the epidemic to make people care about doing something about the epidemic in this new administration. And and just sitting there, I became invisible uh, because of in 2017 that there was a need to do this, that we could get people to care if, it, if the epidemic looked a little bit differently. I was extremely disappointed. I understood where they were going. I understood it, but I don't mean that I accepted it. Um, I, I have to say, uh, Nana and the other ladies were talking about the affinity group that Laurel started at the summit. Well, we also, uh, the Black, there were uh, an affinity group that that met at the summit that uh, Ash and I had the privilege of, of facilitating. And while we discovered that women, black women living with HIV, have a need to have a safe space or to talk about advocacy, wellness, and some of the specific needs of black women living with HIV. And so I'm really excited that they've decided to continue the conversation in this meeting space and uh, around advocacy and wellness for black women living with HIV. So I echo the things that Nana said that about we can't end this epidemic without addressing these forms of oppression. We can talk and make these other strategies, but at the end of the day, public health can't be vanilla. The response can't be vanilla. And and lastly, you know, we're, I think we, we, we have to explain or talk about why and what it feels like. And, at the end of the day, black women cannot dismantle racism. Um, I, I welcome joining with my other sisters to do it, but it's going to take more than just us. So we've been speaking this, but I'm so glad to have partners in this amongst other women to begin to talk about what we need to do, how do we bring these issues to light, and how do we talk about multiple forms of oppression that unless we start calling out and covering and opening up, are not we're not going to get to the end of this. So. Anyway, I thank you guys for the time. Oh, and I, I'm, I'm not sure who I'm handing it off to. <laughs> I think Laurel's up next. If you're talking, Laurel, you're being brilliant on mute. <laughs>
Laurel, are you there? Okay, let me try it through here. Can you hear me through the computer? We can. Okay, okay. Um, we tested it before, but um, now, now I'll do it this way. Okay, so um, so I'm Laurel Sprite. I think probably most of you know me. I am um, currently the um, Global Research Fellow in HIV Gender and Justice for the HIV Justice Network, working on issues of criminalization, um, and also a, a, a really proud member of the Positive Women's Network, especially especially tonight, hearing the presentations that we just heard, which were powerful and brilliant and just uh, should be shown and heard everywhere. So I want to thank everyone who's here for taking the time to join this community today. Um, my talk is organized around just three slides that have three quotes in them that have been important to my journey. Um, everything else I share will just come come directly from me. Um, send a little note in the chat box if you can't hear me. Um, you can't hear me well. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. So the first um, the first quote comes from the poet Adrian Rich. Adrian Rich. And she said, when someone tells me a piece of truth which has been withheld from me and which I needed in order to see my life more clearly, it may bring me acute pain, but it can also flood me with a cold, C-sharp wash of relief. So about 12 years ago, I spent three weekends over the course of six months at a grown-up sleepaway camp that I called anti-racism camp. The real name of it was even better. It was called Doing Our Own Work. And it was an intensive reading, journaling, discussion, and action program for white women who wanted to be actively anti-racist. About a dozen of us at a time would go through the program, and we committed to learning history, to examining ourselves, to supporting each other, and also to taking anti-racist action in our own community during the course of, of that six months so we could support each other to, 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 to actually try to make change. I was living with HIV at the time. Um, I was going to school. I didn't have my Social Security income that I had previously, so I had no money, and I got a scholarship to attend. Almost all of the women in the group, and, and I learned almost all of the women who attended these groups, were lesbians, so I felt right at home. Um, but what felt even better was that for the first time in my life, I was surrounded by other white people who expressly wanted to be anti-racist and to challenge racism. I want to challenge every white person on the phone today with a challenge that the program facilitators gave us which is to spend a week noticing every day what it means in each moment that you remember to do this. You have to try to remember to do this. Noticing each day what it means to be white. One of the things about whiteness in America is that we are trained, most of us, I should you know, at least speak from my own experience, to not notice that whiteness is seen as normal. And so um, it actually takes some conscious effort to think, what does it mean right now when I'm driving in my car? What does it mean in the grocery store? What does it mean when I drive by a police officer? What does it mean when I take my kid to school? What does it mean that I'm white? And so I challenge you to do this. So why did I want to go to um, anti-racism and, and do my own work? Okay, the biggest reason was that I felt alone in the extent to which I felt racism was a deep-seated wrong and that it shaped so much of everything, social, political, economic, around me. And not only did I, I feel alone in that, I was afraid to have real conversations with other white people because I couldn't imagine what I could say. What do you say to people who either don't care or don't believe that racism exists and shapes our society? You can't just jump up and down and say you're wrong, even when you feel that way, as many of us do. But so how do you make white people care? And so a few years later, I'll come back to this, um, I organized a racial justice workshop at a church, the church I attended. And this brilliant woman named Jonah Olson um, came to facilitate. Her organization is called Cultural Bridges. We had so many people register from the church, mostly white people, that we had to have a wait list for the workshop, which was a huge surprise, wonderful surprise. So one woman in the workshop asked Jonah the question that I had, how do you make white people care about racism? And Jonah turned the question back on all of us and asked, well, what changed you? If we are white and we care about racial justice, what brought us here? I would, of course, like to think that I was just born this way, but it's a dangerous line of thought because it implies other people were not, and there's nothing we can do but look down on other white people and, and, and expect the worst. It's a dead end. However, if we can be brave and reflective enough, then we can start to unravel some of what turns us in a direction that allows us to do the work to connect with our sisters and brothers of different skin colors and try to understand why we are pulled apart. It's not easy, in my experience, to face racism in American society. Everything around tells you it's not nice to talk about racism, that you might offend someone. You might uh, find out something unbearable about your family. Um, and, and, and gives the idea that it's worse, worse to try to address racism and do it wrong 
than to just ignore racism and accept the status quo. But I ask, what if we can be brave, like Andrea and Riches in this quote? And I have this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that says, and I'm going to substitute racism for segregation. Racism distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator or the racist or the racially dominant person a false sense of superiority and the person, the segregator or the person who experiences racism, a false sense of inferiority. And I think, um, I'm going to try to move quickly because uh, I want to jump quickly through some of these remarks, but I think this is one of the, one of the main reasons that white people um, for ourselves, should be care should care about addressing racism. I believe that no one ever wanted to grow up to be a Nazi. I don't think anyone ever wants to grow up to be racist. And we owe a great debt of gratitude. I personally feel a great debt of gratitude to all the civil rights activists, past and present, who did work and made an investment in American society at great, great, great risk offered to themselves that made American society a little less racist, I think, or racism a little less acceptable. Um, when I was born than it was for people who are older than me, and I had a little bit of a better chance to grow up a little bit less racist than I might have been. Um, and, and I can't what was worse than to grow up to become something that you find so, so despicable. So many of us know just what, too much what it's like to be considered worthless, to be considered unimportant, and it can be because we have HIV, because we're poor, because we've been drug users, because we've done sex work. And we know how vulnerable we are when we're people that aren't cared for. Um, and, and, and I think some of us, and I'm one of them, can take that sense of vulnerability of knowing that people can hurt you when you're not considered valuable. I take that sense of vulnerability and use it to fuel our own determination that no one else should ever feel that way. No one else should be mistreated, much less shot or killed, as we know black families across America face right now, just because someone around felt that the person they hurt didn't really matter. We need to say not on our watch. And I believe that's what Peter Lynn is doing right now with the work to fight racism. So let me go to this last slide. I'll read it in a moment. But I just want to say briefly, what is anti-racism? Anti-racism means to do something, to stand up against racism, to do it within ourselves, where racism can lodge itself in stereotypes and biases, fears, assumptions, can lodge itself in our communities and families, and it can be newly fueled in those places by hateful political rhetoric. Um, racism can be found in our connections. Um, or anti, sorry, anti-racism work needs to be done in our connections with women living with HIV and AIDS activists, where otherwise it might limit our solidarity and impede our sense of urgency against injustice. And anti-racism work means we have to look at our economic and political systems where people are systematically under, underemployed and underpaid because of their skin color and because we allow policies happen, to happen that damage people and families and communities of color. And we'll talk more in future seminars about what anti-racism is, but I want to say it's not enough to just be nice on an interpersonal level, because that doesn't change deep-seated racial dynamics. There has to be active, proactive work for racial justice. Anti-racism doesn't mean that we ignore other isms, um, including uh, classism and, and hatred of people who are poor. We don't, we don't ignore sexism. We don't uh, ignore homophobia. We don't ignore transphobia. But we do look at the ways that these interlinked with racism, and then we commit to broader understandings of solidarity and connectedness. So it's difficult. It's scary. We're taught not to have these kinds of conversations. At least I can say as a white woman, we're taught not to have these kinds of conversations. But the only way we move forward in solidarity is to be brave and to, and, and, and to, to, to speak out. And so I'll conclude with this quote from Audre Lorde, the poet, writer, civil rights activist, an activist on many, many fronts, who said, speak your truth even if your voice shakes. And we invite the women of PWN, PWN to join together on this journey against racism and for racial justice with us. We're all volunteers um, doing this because we think it's important to make this as a personal commitment that's for us and by us and for all of us. So thank you all. And I think Jenny will take over from here. Okay, okay can you all hear me? Yes. Am I um, successfully unmuted? Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we have a little video compilation that a few of us, um, you know, we were doing this with limited time or we, we could have gotten some more voices involved, but there were, um, you know, a few folks who wanted to um, kind of share their thoughts on why uh, this work was so important. So um, we're going to try to play it and hopefully it's going to work. Sorry, not that one. Nope, that's not it. Sorry. 
I'm apparently not doing well today. Sorry. Ah! Oh, my goodness. Sorry. I had it all pulled up and then I screwed it up. Okay, hold on. Let's see if this works. Hi, Wanda Brindle Moss here. I struggled when I was first told that systemic racism was an issue. I now know that it is definitely a fact that racism is thriving and growing everywhere in the United States. Just for reference, I can see it, but I can't hear it. In dismantling racism. Join us. Hi, my name is Angel, and I attended the 2016 uh, Women's Summit in Fort Walton Beach. And the unity of women there, just we were, we were diverse, diverse in all in so many different ways. Yet we all came together for a common cause to about an opportunity to join the the group of anti-racism. Um, the white women wanting to embrace and to try to uh, go over the hurdle of racism with our sisters there, our sisters in solidarity. Because without that, without us looking past race or finding a way to meet each other halfway, we really just cannot. We can't meet our common goal. It's fighting amongst us. Hi, this is Barb. I've been embroidering some patches lately and have had a lot of time to think. I've been meditating on how proud I am of Pivot Event and the work we did at the Speak Up Summit. Starting at the Affinity Session for white women working to dismantle racism. We really acknowledge that this is work that we have to do, that it's difficult, that it is challenging. But by doing it, we support our sisters living with HIV and PWN in the end. Better for it. Hi, my name is Laura Spray, and I'm part of the U.S. Positive Women's Network. It is important and really meaningful for me to be able to join another white women to fight racism, especially because women of color who are living with HIV in particular African American and I want to remove that from myself, and I want to be sure that I can be fully present, fully and fully committed um, to fighting racism with other my sisters who are African American and Latino, Native American, Asian, uh, Muslim American, uh, and all my sisters are really um, so that we can uh, be in solidarity. Uh, I'm proud to be actively involved in doing anti-racist work because it's not enough just to have black friends or to not discriminate against other people myself. Um, I have to be actively part of the solution. I worry about a lot of things in my life, but one thing that I haven't ever had to worry about is police harassment or um, you know getting shot by the police when I get pulled over for a speeding ticket. Um, I've never had to worry about not getting an apartment I wanted because of the color of my skin or having my resume overlooked because of my name. Um, you know, these are things that are real to a lot of people. And I have worked hard in my life, but there are other people who have worked even harder who have ended up with less. If we want our society to really be fair and equal, um, then it's all of our responsibility to do anti-racist work. Um, racism was a problem, is a problem that was created by white people, not black or brown people. Um, and that means that as white people, we need to end the problem. We have that response. Anti racism work is important for many reasons. It isn't and has never been acceptable to stand by and proclaim that you're not racist while the systems do not change. I dream of a day when I do not have to worry if my child can see herself reflected on mainstream TV, find a doll that looks like her in the store, or believe that she can truly achieve anything she puts her mind to. I dream of a day when my Latinx brothers and sisters can walk the streets without fear of being harassed or worrying that their families will be torn apart by the threat of deportation. I demand the day 
but I don't worry every time my partner leaves the house that he may not be home and he'll be the next unarmed black man to be murdered in the streets that day. I submit to our comfortable conversation as I not only challenge racism, but work to dismantle it alongside the people I love. Until there is true equality, I can see nothing. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go back to the slides. Oh, where did we go? Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay, and we also had a quote. Um, Wahida had made a video, but the file format was not working. Um, so she sent us the, uh, the, the quote, so I'll go ahead and read it for her. Um, when amazing people gather together, oftentimes it is a catalyst for amazing things to happen. Several amazing things happened at PWN's 2016 National Speak Up Summit. One of the most remarkable um, that came about was the formation of an affinity group to address racism. This group was formed by members of our PWN sisterhood who are white women. With courage and determination, they embarked on a journey of personal growth, challenging their own ideals and principles in an effort to become a central component of dismantling the racial problems which continue to plague black and brown citizens in this country of professed freedom and liberty. Standing in solidarity with PWN USA, the White Women's Affinity Group has continued to meet to explore the nature of privilege and educate themselves in ways to meaningfully contribute to the movement for racial justice. This has been a liberating experience for each of them. We are deeply appreciative, that, appreciative of them and the work they're configuring around dismantling racism, some of which they will be sharing with us in a webinar series. Support is an action word. I love that. I just editorialized, sorry. So we ask that you show support of them, their affinity group to address racism and their work of dismantling racism by taking the action of making time to attend and positively participate in each session in their webinar series. Thank you so much for that, Wahida. Um, and we also, there was a couple of, um, Great blog post we got uh, from Kat and also from Darlene, and I'll send out the links to those later because I know we're probably a little bit short on time, but that's just a little view into why um, the work is important to, uh, to us and also to why it matters to um, our black and brown sisters. And I think I'm supposed to hand it off now to someone. Me. Um, Jenny, this is Carrie. You're handing off to me just for purposes later because I think Q&A is after me. My chat box disappeared after you played the video. Can you try to get it back? <laughs> so okay, I, I am... Oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how, but I will... It might be something that you can do, but I'll, I'll see. I'm sorry. Okay. If not, I, I'll anyway, I'll ask I'm questions just... from the chat box. Sorry. Okay, cool. I'm not ignoring anyone. I can't see you. Um... So in terms of steps moving forward, and I want to thank everybody um, who agreed to present on this webinar and everyone that we're going to reach out to in the future to present on future webinars. Um, but just in terms of kind of what things are going to look like moving forward, um, you heard earlier what our commitment was as the women of PWN dismantling racism. Um, and we um, have a strategy of what we're going to do to, to do this work. Um, so first, we're going to be holding webinars every other month. Um, this was our introductory webinar. The, the webinars moving forward will be different um, topics and concepts that are related to um, curriculum that's been developed around anti-racist work um, and working to dismantle racism. Um, we believe that the webinars really should be a forum for all of us to discuss race and privilege and power and socioeconomics and intersectionality and a number um, of things, gender disparity is a number of things that we've kind of touched on in this introductory um, webinar but didn't really dig into. And each one um, will have one or a few topics um, that they're focused on. Those will go hand in hand. Um, starting in February, uh, we're going to move through some curriculum and discussion groups. And the discussion groups will be specifically for white women living with HIV. Um, as a way to fulfill our commitment um, that we as white women are committed to having difficult conversations, um, to challenging and examining racism in ourselves and in our communities and those around us who we may love. That came up multiple times um, in our affinity session, how difficult it is when you personally, um, you know, feel like you're doing 
um, um, some good work with yourself, but somebody you love, your grandfather, your auntie, whomever, um, says things that are, are racist um, in their basis. And how do we challenge that? And how do we move forward? And like Laurel said, how do we make other people care about that? So the curriculum and discussion groups will be linked together. Um, the curriculum will kind of flow over the two months, so it will be only a one one every other month discussion group, um, but we'll have various um, broad topics with a lot of nuanced readings and videos and things to support um, learning within those groups. Um, and we're asking that white women who want to participate in that um, are willing to make a one-year commitment, so willing to do this work throughout 2017. And the hope is that we'll have a second group of women because we only have so much capacity in terms of, of leadership for these groups right now that, that we'll be able to do another group and another set of women in 2018. And then we are committed to doing report back. So, so part of what will be covered um, in videos and webinars and blogs um, is really us um, being vulnerable and women who agree committing to kind of share what they're learning and um, things that are surprising to them and being really vulnerable and I appreciate um, all of the women who made videos um, and many of the women who posted on Facebook or, or made blogs that really were vulnerable um, and honest and transparent about what doing this work means about what um, evaluating and and being introspective about racism looks like and, and really being thoughtful about how we're going to continue this in a meaningful way that's not just about um, examining ourselves, but that's really going to impact the community and really do work to dismantle racism. I appreciate that Benita said that earlier, um, that this really is our challenge and, and our commitment at Speak Up was, was to commit to dismantling racism, to commit um, to, to broadening um, understanding and knowledge within our community of women living with HIV and beyond. So that is what things are going to kind of look like moving forward. Um, and if folks have kind of thoughts about that, we, we welcome that. We've, we've developed the curriculum, um, but there's not, uh, it's, there's, there's a little wiggle movement. So if we're, we're missing things or there's something that you think is really important, um, let us know. Uh, and you can do that. There will be a link a little bit later on so you can know how to sign up for the groups. And I believe Jenny, um, God love her, has agreed to kind of be the go-between um, for this group. So if folks have questions or things they really want us to hear, um, you can email Jenny with those, with those comments and topics. And I'm going to hand back to Jenny because I still can't see the chat box. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Um, okay, so I can see the chat box. I'm not sure why there have been so many chat box problems tonight. I, I don't know what's going on with the system, but um, but it is. Uh, this is a time for primarily for questions, um, comments, as long as you know they're cool and respectful and everything. So. Um, if anyone has a question for any of our presenters, uh, please go ahead and put it in the chat box. And I will uh, read it to them. And I did um, put a link to the sign up for the discussion groups in the chat box. Um, and my email as well. And we will send out to everyone who participated in the webinar these links as well so that you'll you'll have them. Uh, Wahida says, awesome webinar, well thought out training. Did you all mediate yourselves? I don't know if Carrie or Barbara, someone wants to uh, to answer that. Sorry, I I lost the webinar altogether. Mm -hmm. Did did you ask if she if we mediated ourselves? Yeah, I, th I think. Uh, Wahida, well, let me know if I'm, I'm if I'm interpreted. I think in the term like in the sense of organizing yourselves and sort of you know running your own thing. Yeah, so we we've actually had a number of calls since the summit. Um, 
as a core group um, of people that participated. Um, and there were um, six of us, right now there's five of us, there may be six of us again, um, who kind of helped to put together the framework for this webinar. Um, the, the concept moving forward is that we will kind of facilitate um, the discussion groups that will all work from a core curriculum, but that will facilitate the discussion groups. And then our hope is actually that we will do minimal presenting on the webinars um, because the goal is really to make the webinars a diverse um, conceptual platform, um, not just filled with white women, uh, so that we have a really broad um, dialogue moving forward um, as a group of, of PWN folks. Um, about race and anti-racist work and, and a number of other concepts that we've kind of laid out in the curriculum. I hope that Thank answers you, your Carrie. question, Wahida. Okay, Wahida says, thank you. This is so very important for all of us. It really is. <laughs> Uh, Vanita says, I love what you're doing. Please let me know how I can support y'all if needed. And I, yeah, Vanita, we can always, always use some Vanita support. I, I think I'm speaking for everyone, but. <laughs> <laughs> Are there uh, other questions or comments? Wanda says it has and she'll continue to be an amazing journey. Uh, Tony says great presentation. Vanita says awesome. You guys are not asking tough questions here. <laughs> Nana says great job, everyone. Thank you for doing this important work. Wahida says great blog, Kat. I'm reading everything in the chat box since I know some of you can't see it. So. Oh, and Vanita, this was meant for you. I'm from Laurel. Vanita, we will really appreciate any help from you. Thanks very much for being so supportive. Oh, wait, Vanita, you are in the presenter box. Just kidding. Sorry. I'm confused about who's in here. <laughs> uh, Vanita asks, how has this effort affected you in your private life? Is that a question for any particular person, Vanita, or is it just an open question? Any of y'all? Who would like to answer that, how this effort has affected you in your private life, in your personal life? Have there been any changes? Anyone want to share? So that this has had I, an I'm impact here. on you in, in your personal life? Apparently, I'll answer again. This is Carrie again. So, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, my video was pretty clear. So my my daughter is um, is black and Latina and white, um, and this work and this issue and and all the intersectionality was apparent to me um, early on, but really was magnified. Um, things that I don't know that I ever thought about before um, were magnified after having her. Like how much it really peeves me off that I can't just go into the store and pick out a Barbie that looks like my child, um, that I have to go online and spend stupid amounts of money um, to get her, you know, a family of Barbies that look like her. Um, and, yeah, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Benita. I'm glad to be part of your world. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think one of the things, um, and I know we didn't get to read this, and I know Jenny was going to send it out later, that was really impactful for me and, and Darlene, you posted it on social media, so hopefully it's okay that I'm sharing it. Um, Jenny actually shared with us, and I'm glad because I have not done a great job of monitoring social media, but um, Darlene participated in our original group, um, and I was really exceptionally moved um, by a statement that she posted that I think Jenny will send out later um, about how she was raised to believe that um, you know, we should be colorblind and everyone is equal and she thought she was doing a good job and that she actually came to um, our affinity session at the summit and her words were and she realized that she's a racist and she has 
um, enrolled in some curriculum and taken some classes and is now really committed um, to focusing on this work. And, and as Jenny sent me that and I was reading it at a stoplight, um, I started crying because I think that's exactly what my hope is in doing this work um, and why I showed up for the affinity session and why I've agreed um, to help um, move this group's mission forward um, is because I hope that people who maybe aren't aware, um, who maybe do think they're not racist and really um, are saying things that, that are microaggressions, um, um, really can see that that there are things that they can change and improve and in ways that we can really be reflective, that they really do start driving in their car and thinking, hey, what does it mean to be white and drive in my car? Um, things that, you know, oftentimes we don't think about. Um, Darlene's statement was really beautiful, and I really appreciate, again, her and many others being so vulnerable um, and transparent and honest um, when it's not hard um, and speaking their truth, even if their voices shake. Thanks, Carrie. And the, the back of Anita's question for a second, I could just say in my personal life, um, it, you know, it, I'm actually not speaking to my parents anymore, at least for the time being, um, you know, as a result, uh, sort of of the election, but sort of, you know, a lot of the racial tensions that brought to the surface, my parents voted for um, Donald Trump. And I, you know, it just sort of brought conversations that I was not comfortable having with them to the surface, I let them know why, because otherwise it wouldn't have served any kind of purpose to, to stop speaking to them without them knowing why. Um, so I did, you know, send a very long letter about why. Um, but, you know, it does, it, sometimes doing it means you have to have those conversations and sometimes you have to cut people off, I think, who are, you know, who once you've told them and you've tried to, to have the conversations, sometimes they have to understand that, you know, the impact is bigger maybe than they realize. So I'm not saying that that's necessarily the best way to go about things, and but and I'm sure it's deeper than that too. But it's just sort of an example, I guess. Um, oh, Laurel, Laurel says she's sorry, but she can't figure out how to get off mute again. She wanted to highlight Connie's question: Has anyone considered using storytelling to help with the anti-racist work? So I think that, and I think that's really, really important. important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in our rush with our technology challenges, one of the things um, that we were, were hoping to ask for early on, um, because we were in such a rush to create these videos, was for anyone who has a statement that they want to make about this work, about why this work is important, um, about experiences, really anything that kind of relates to this topic, um, that we hope that you'll create a blog, write a statement, send a video, um, and that we can continue to integrate those into the webinars and into our curriculum um, and into our updates moving forward because I do think that um, videos and storytelling are really powerful um, and really offer us kind of another facet to, to do this work moving forward. Thank you, Carrie. And yeah, we were, that's definitely one of um, our focus areas and I, I have some ideas for that as well that I'll be bringing to this group and yeah we'll definitely be putting calls out for blogs and narratives and videos and so forth so lots of opportunities for anyone who's out there who um you know feels moved to either write or make a video there will definitely go go for it and send it to us and we'll be putting out calls for those as well And then Laurel says, to answer Vanita, for me, I feel more supported to speak out because I've been able to practice and role play interrupting racism so I could be more prepared when racist comments and situations arose. That is, uh, that's, that's really great. And I think it's something we need to do more often because it, is, it can be very difficult to have those conversations with people that we love, especially um, when we know it's going to be hard and not go over well and some of us don't like to you know, start a fight, so it can really be hard. Uh, Laurel says, I've also had to realize for me that I have to find ways to meet white people where they are and listen as much as possible because we have to find ways to bring people over wherever, whenever we can. And that is definitely true. And it's definitely possible too. Um, and then Darlene says, let me know what it can do. Definitely will. Um, I hope you'll sign up for the discussion groups um, and be part of the future webinars and get to take part of the group. And um, I think there was a question about whether we were going to send the presentation out over email. So I do intend to send um, an email to everybody who participated in the webinar. Um, 
with uh, the link to the recording when it's ready, also links to some of these blogs that we, that we mentioned, um, the video, et cetera, so that you'll have all of that uh, ready. This is Kat. Can I make a comment on the storytelling question? Yeah. Great. So as I was sitting here thinking about this, I, I think that can go two different ways or both. <clears throat> Number one, I think there's some really important storytelling um, that can inform our work. I think what's also really going to be interesting is to um, find find ways to communicate how we are changing through this work, not just in the ways that we're changing people around us, but internally. And so I'm really excited to see that um, by the end of the year at, at the, at the start anyway, um, mainly because like we come into this discussion in different places. Some of us have done some of this work. Some of us have done none of this work. Some of us have done a lot. And so it'll be really, I think, a really interesting thing to kind of um, draw together. So anyway, I just wanted you to know that that story really sparked that kind of internal dialogue for me. Thank you, Kat. Yeah, that's definitely true and a very good point. Thank you. So, so I'm we're right over with being it. just a couple. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just going to say I'm tasked with being the timekeeper, and we're three minutes over. So um, I think Kat has the slide to take us out, which was our mission again. Absolutely. So the reason that we have this mission again, just so all of you who are participating in this call understand why we're doing it this way, we thought it was really important to both open and close with our mission so that it's very clear to everyone where we're coming from and what the purpose of this work is for us. So the mission of our group is to create a space for open dialogue to address racism among ourselves and our communities in a spirit of cultural humility. Um, so I hope that that really highlights what the purpose is. And I think that that's probably clear after this webinar, but I, I'm really appreciative of all of the input from everyone, including all the participant comments. So thank you. And I suppose I can just close it out since we're pretty much done with the webinar. Um, we definitely look forward to future conversations and putting in the work. And don't forget that I think, um, not Carrie, sorry, Jenny was gonna be sending out the, both the link for the discussions, as the discussion groups, as well as the, um, well, there it is again. So the link is in your chat box. Um, and um, I think you also said that you would be sending out the webinar slides also so thank you all so much for coming and for participating and giving us your time and we hope to continue to see you on our future webinars